so glad to have you here, Ray. Um, really appreciate the time. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the world's, how you formed the world's biggest hedge fund. And uh, we're going to also talk about your outlook for the economy and get your thoughts on the markets. Um, but before that, I, I know that you've observed three forces that you say uh, are taking shape in the world and haven't occurred in our lifetimes. I think one of those forces is uh, the excessive printing of money, um, internal, second one is internal conflict, and, and the third, if I'm correct, is the rise of an economic superpower. And I want to get to those pieces. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to ask if you, I, I want to see if you can identify um, one quote that, uh, that was uh, a statement that was made back in May of 2021. So the, the big issue is the amounts of money that have been produced and put into the system and that together with a lesser impact on the economy of COVID, as we get past that is going to create, is creating a giant sim stimulation that is having an inflationary impact. So you're going to see a big impact increase in the inflation rate and that'll become an issue. This was said in May of 2021. Who said it? I couldn't tell you. You. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> How did you know at that point in May of 2021? I mean, inflation was percolating, but not to the extent that it is now. What, what, what signals did you see that gave you the sense that we were going to see, see this, set, this type of inflation that we're seeing now? This ain't complicated, you know? Uh, if you give people a lot of money and credit, they're going to spend a lot. So, look, the price of anything is equivalent to the amount of money that's spent on it divided by the quantity of it show produced. So when you have a ton of money that's handed out, money and credit that's handed out, there's going to be a ton of spending on it, on goods, services, and financial assets. And then there are also bottlenecks to be able to produce you because you're near capacity. Did you this know, isn't complicated. Did, did you Economics know, is by and large not complicated. Did you know that we'd shoot to a 40 year high? Did you get that? Did you have that sense? Oh yeah, you could just do the calculations. So, you know, so- what It's you, mechanics, if, if I can, the thing I would like to do more than anything is always um, teach a man how to fish rather than to give them the fish. And so I'd like to, whenever we have that opportunity, to explain, let's say, a little bit of the mechanics in common sense ways so that people themselves can see the essentials. For example, then, when you have a situation where inflation has reasons to be structurally high, and you're an investor and you think that cash is safe because it doesn't move around much, and you're losing a lot of buying power, you're losing a lot of wealth. And so mechanical basic things like that is really what I'd like to convey. That's why I'm really looking forward to this, if I can help And I people. think the audience is definitely gonna appreciate that for sure. So what do you think the Fed, need? it's Fed Day, what do you think the Fed needs to do to get inflation in check? You, know, you had Jamie Dimon today in prepared remarks, he's gonna testify in front of uh, Congress talking about how inflation is, is really hurting consumers. What, what, what does the Fed need to do? The Fed always has a trade-off between, just you gotta understand this, um, they have a trade-off between strength in the economy and inflation because <clears throat> when they put out more money and credit, it creates a lot more spending. So what you basically have is items that become expensive and then they take money away, right? They take money away, they make it more expensive. And so fighting inflation has a cost. You know, you hear a lot like they say, okay, we'll raise interest rates and we'll fight inflation. And they don't talk about the pain that also comes from that. Right. So what they will do is balance it. It will go on until the economic pain is greater than the inflation pain. They will tighten monetary policy and take away credit until the economic pain is greater than the inflation pain. Now we play the game of what level will that be? Um, it, there's, there's a level at which inflation probably levels out, settles at. 
and we can play a lot around what, what, what level do you think that might be? Uh, I, I think it's between four and five percent. I think it's going to go, there's a hump, there's going to be a drop down, and then there's going to be a higher level of settling because of reasons. There's not enough money, they're going to print money, and they're going to devalue money, the value of money. So that means um, that, uh, uh, now think about if you're holding money and you're saving or you're an investor. That means you get negative real returns. So that means that I think that they have to get the uh, interest rate up, short rates and long rates up, to the vicinity of probably 4.5%-ish, like there's nothing precise. Right. It could be higher than that, because um, that it still would probably be a zero net inflation rate. But anyway, somewhere in that vicinity. And that's going to then have an effect on markets and the economy. Because when you raise interest rates, then it affects all asset classes because they have to compete with that higher interest rate. Funding becomes more expensive and so on. And so that has a downward effect on stocks and other markets. And, that, and, and then it has credit spreads and it, and it has its consequences. I so think, I think it'll look something like that. I think you had said or written recently that uh, you calculated that the S&P 500 needs to go down another 20%. Do you still hold to that or you think? Yeah, I think, it, uh, look, there's, well, a saying more in, there's a saying in, in my business that he who lives by the crystal ball is destined to eat ground glass. <laughs> um, and I'll emphasize, you know, but I do believe that. In other words, I do believe that um, as you raise the interest rate so that it's appropriate, that competitiveness is going to drive it down. And then also, it will hurt earnings. It'll hurt the economy. So both of those factors, the first we call the discount rate, right. when present value of cash flows, the discount rate goes up, it does, and then it has a negative effect. So I can't say exactly or anything, but I think that we're in that kind of an environment. Yeah. You, uh, you, you think that companies uh, or companies have pr appropriately discounted cash flows going out? I'm, of saying, I'm, I'm saying that when one makes an investment, one puts a lump sum payment for future cash flows. And then, in order to say what they're worth, we uh, take the present value of those, which you, we use an, a discount rate, because it's the competitive rate that all assets. And that's what makes the um, all boats rise and decline together, you know? Right. When you change the discount rate, when, when you bring interest rates down to zero, or about zero, uh, then what happens is it raises all asset prices and it makes everything, and housing prices and everything. And then when you go the other way, it um, has the opposite effect. So as we're raising those rates because of the present value effect, it lowers the value of asset classes if their cash flows were the same. But their cash flows won't be the same because there'll be less buying of assets, le less not only buying of financial assets, but there'll be less buying of goods and services and so on. So um, you fight um, inflation with economic pain. Right. That's the only way you have to break something in some ways. Um, do you, so as we think about, you know, just shifting gears a little bit, as we think about, um, you've studied the empires of, you know, t I think you've t studied 10 civilizations spanning 500, 500 years. Uh, what, what have you learned? And do you yeah, think I, we're, I, we're I just, just want to explain, to like, I'm a practical guy having to make money in the markets. That's my game. That's what I do. But what I learned a lot of times is the things that surprised me in my lives were things that never happened in my lifetimes before, but happened before that. It was because of studying the Great Depression that we were able to anticipate the 2008 financial crisis, and we made a lot of money in the 2008 financial crisis, because we understood that. There are three things that are happening in our lifetimes that never happened before, and they are big drivers. The first is the amounts of debt that we have and the, and the rates of debt creation that we have and the monetization of those debts. In other words, central banks printing money and buying those financial assets. Nothing has come close to the amounts that we have. You have to go back to the 30s to see that. 
the and, we, and we've seen a tremendous amount of money printing since the 2000 yeah, financial that's crisis. Right. And COVID perhaps also magnified that because you had to stimulate the economy globally. Well, we're in a world where the need for money is so much greater than the amount of money. Like if you think about yourself and you think I have to, when I think about how much I spend, I have to think about maybe what I don't spend on so that I can spend it on something else because there's a limited amount of money. We have a situation now where I, we can rattle off. It, it, could be, it could be the wealth gaps, it could be infrastructure, it could be the green economy, it could be you know, the estimated cost of uh, the war with Ukraine is um, eight to nine trillion dollars. COVID was 16 trillion dollars. We have to spend more money on defense as the world becomes more threatening. There, everybody says we need to spend more money, and we do, in a sense, need to spend more money. But you don't, where, you don't, where is that money? Where does it come from? If you had a hard monetary system, then you would uh, have to then get it from somewhere else. And now we can't do that. We don't do that. We have a fiat monetary system. So we're going to- So you to, have to print it. So yeah, so today, for example, we're still going to run a very big budget deficit, about 5% of GDP, even though the budget deficit comes down because it was wild. So it comes down to 5% of GDP. That means that the federal government is going to have to sell bonds, 5% of GDP, a lot. Now the, treas the Federal Reserve says it's going to reduce the balance sheet. So it's going to sell another 5% of GDP right. in the form of those bonds. That's 10% I mean, the, the, the of GDP. The now Fed's balance sheet is still pretty rich at around $9 trillion. Yes, but it's got to come down by 1.1 trillion a year is their plan. Which is also going to pull liquidity out of the market. It, yeah, it just means now, sell, okay, they got to sell bonds, they got to sell bonds. Uh, uh, okay, now who's going to buy those bonds? Right. Or where's the spending? So we have a situation. Is China going to buy those bonds? Not as much. No, 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 not much. So that puts, it, that put, puts the U.S. in a pickle. No, and, and, and think about it as investors. Um, is a bond portfolio, it's changed what a bond portfolio is. You know, we had a 40-year bull market in bonds. And so everybody owning bonds and being, the price would go up. And that was self-reinforcing for 40 years. Then interest rates get down to low levels and so on, and they're still holding bonds. I mean, negative real returns. Now you have negative real returns in the bonds. Right. And you got them going down. So then you have, uh, uh, let's say, pension funds, endowments. They, they, what is the bond piece doing for me? What do I want to own? So they're impro motivated to sell bonds. The public is motivated to sell bonds. How do we balance this thing? Th the that, way you that normally being... balance that, let me just make that point. Now, excuse me for, your, for stopping your interruption. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 um, the way you do that is you reduce the amount of private credit. And when that, you reduce the amount of private credit, you then spend less and so on. So one has to always look at that balance sheet and whether it's a good deal or not to own debt. And, when, and debt is the easiest thing um, to um, stimulate. In other words, where are you going to get the money from? Like we look, you, you know, we needed to send out all those checks for all those different reasons. If you take it from somebody, they get angry. You take it from taxes. You, it becomes very controversial. Hardly anyone pays attention to where the money come from or what is it going to cost. Well, it comes from the fact that you produce a higher level of inflation and the holders of those debt assets get bad returns in real dollars. But they don't even pay too much attention to the real dollars yet until it dawns on them because they keep thinking that the least risk investment is cash and they lose so much money to cash. Which, which uh, brings me to another question. Is, is given where we are now in the economic cycle or where we're headed, is, is cash still trash? Cash is still gonna be a negative real return. It's still gonna be a trashy investment. Depends how it compares with the others. You know, okay, everything is, we're in this write down financial assets mode. So the second thing, that was the first thing, I wanna make sure we cover the it, second The, the second thing, thing is internal conflict. Yeah. Um, 
by any measure, um, we now have the largest amount of political and internal conflict since about 1900, even more than the, um, during the 30s. Um, and you see it. Um, you, and that's between populists of the left and populists of the right. In other do, you, words, do, you, do you think it's more than the civil rights era? Where, where oh yeah, no, by any measures. Well, they, in, they, what measures are you using? Um, I'm using voting record, I'm using wealth gaps. Well, it, some of the measures, I'm using voting re records, okay. If you take the amount of economic policies and you say are conservative and liberal, and you take the, each of the parties, the uh, Republicans are more conservative than they've ever been, and the um, Democrats are more liberal than they have ever been, and the voting across party lines is the least it's been since 1900. So you have that. You have, and you have the largest wealth gap that's existed, okay? You, so you have um, what is obviously a big internal debate over practically everything, okay? So, um, and you see it, the, the, the fact that um, it's questionable whether, and let's say in the next presidential election, will both sides accept the election results, okay? Will there be, so you're seeing an internal conflict and it's an ideological conflict, it's an economic conflict, and there kind of needs to be an economic restructuring because you have this, um, these large debts, the large financial assets, the loss of opportunity. Um, my, my wife and I work, particularly she does, uh, in, in, um, in Connecticut on disengaged and disconnected high school students. Poor neighborhoods, okay, I'll give you a statistic. 22% of the high school students in Connecticut, which is one of the richest states in the country, 22% are either disengaged or disconnected. Disengaged means that they have an absentee rate which is greater than 25% and they're failing classes. And disconnected means they don't know where they are anymore because they've dropped out, 22% of the population. The poverty, and, 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 and we see it around us, the crime rates uh, in the cities and so on is, is an issue. Right. There are many such issues and so there's a lot of conflict. That has economic implications in the narrow sense. What does it mean for tax? What does it mean for redistribution of wealth? How is that going to be? And it also has issues in terms of political. So you're seeing people move from one location to another. And, there, and, and so that dynamic is a big influence. It's not just an influence on markets, but it certainly is an influence on markets because you change tax rates, you change other things and it'll affect the markets, but it's a big influence in our lives and how that plays out. So two, two, two quick questions off of that. One, um, do you, given a lot of what we said at the top of this conversation, do you think we're in a recession or headed to one soon? Um, we, we are right now very close to um, a, a zero percent growth. You know, there's nothing magical about this line zero, a bit above, a little bit below, it doesn't right. matter. Okay, we're very, very close to that, and we're largely uh, living off of cash balances that have been built up over a period of time. So you're starting to see a very, very classic, you're, see, you're starting to see the housing and auto sectors, which are the durable goods sectors, then contract. Okay, you're starting to see the cash is drawn down you're starting to see increases in delinquency rates. Right. You're starting to see all the classic early signs, and that's brought it down to very negligible growth. So fa fast, still... fast forward to 2023, 2024 recession, or? Yeah, still... I th no, I think, uh, yes. Uh, again, and, I, and, and if that's, so in 2023? Is... I, think, I, I think it's going to get worse um, into, 23 and then 24, which has implications for elections. Right. What, what, so in other words, I think that the circumstances that we're facing, and, and then the, the third cannot be ignored, which is the international conflict, okay? So I wanna put all three on the table because you can't separate them. What's happening with, uh, for example, the Ukraine and Russian war has implications on inflation and economic conditions 
all around the world, I mean, most particularly Europe, but it has it any, uh, around the world. And if we have a conflict with China, that has enormous economic implications in various ways. And so you have a set of circumstances where those three things come together. That set of circumstances is, is important. So, um, if we're so I want to make sure as we're going into the 24 period, I think they're all, they all play together. Um, and it's all a very risky situation. And it's not just risky. What I saw in the book, um, I, I did a study. Right? Why did I do the 500-year study? Because things happen. This is principles of a changing world order. Yeah, principles of the changing world order. I, I, Which, I, by the I, way, I, put it I was of, walking here. Somebody was reading it on the street, and I thought you planted it. It's was like, <laughs> yeah. what are the chances of that? But one other thing I want to get to is, is this idea as is, is, is well. Recession, 23, 24, um, duration and intensity. Um, it very much depends on the nature of these other things that are happening at the same time. But if you had to um, guess, is, is it going to be deep and long, I, shallow I, I, and quick? Um, I think that there's going to be a, con I think you're going to get stagflation. Okay. How, why, why stagflation? The labor market right now, 3% unemployment looks really strong. I know we're seeing cracks. But otherwise, that wouldn't meet the definition of stagflation. Right? No, 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 no. That's right, because what you—that's, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve's policy is always, uh, what's the greater problem? Right. It ain't the unemployment problem. So, and then how do and I? In trade? fact, they may—they may have to cause an unemployment problem or Th that's a labor market that's problem. That's what I'm saying. Right. Okay. You got to take money away. You've got to raise the unemployment rate. You—I mean, that's how you—you you know, you put on the brakes. And people spend less, and that's how it works. And so I'm saying that I think that we're probably um, at that brink of that change. And then if we're dealing with, um, you know, particularly also the external um, conflict issue, um, you know, that'll play a role. You're, you're having globally um, a kind of war. There are, there are five kinds of war. There's a trade war. There's a technology war. There's a war for geopolitical influence in different areas. There is a capital war, and there's a military war. Those the, the technology war, we, we, is that just competitive technology, or is that cyber? Yeah, well, you, you, you see is that, well, is cyber what's going warfare? on. Well, it can be going to cyber warfare, but it is the sort of war that you're having, uh, let's say, with there's an economic component of that. And then, but the technologies that you develop have a big military implication. Whoever wins the technology war wins the military war. Right, right. And so now, because you have a conflict between China and the United States in terms of uh, all the things we know about, you have a, a, a technology war going on there. That kind of technology war also means that they want, every country wants self-sufficiency. They don't want to be cut off because you can be cut off. So both sides are dealing so with the cut-off. Seems cut like off. a more deglobalized world. So you get deglobalized. Let me, let me interrupt you really, let me, can I, can I interrupt really quickly. I, I do want folks to get a chance to, to ask questions, and, and I think there's some, some people around with mics, and we, we're quickly running out of time, but um, I do want to give an opportunity to that. Do you want so to finish that So let, if you get into, let's say, an economic war with, um, with China, which you can, because sanctions are part of that, um, Are you still investing in China? I, I still, yes. You're still bullish on China? Um, I am I'm bullish for the long run. And that what happens is the prices of assets are low. Um, but let me make the, uh, the point I want to make, which is that 22% um, of all manufactured goods imports come from China. And if you got into a situation where China was like um, Russia, in other words, not it's not cool to invest there. It's not cool to produce, and we say we don't want to have imports from China and so on. That economic impact would be an enormous impact in terms of inflation and goods and services and so on. So what I'm saying is that just as what we've seen from Russia, which is an insignificant country in terms of its economic uh, impact, 
um, and we've seen its economic impact, it would be larger. So as in answer to your first question that I'm trying to answer, is that you have um, this isolation and the breaking down of supply chains and the inefficiencies associated with that, and you have other costs that are taking place the same. You know, the cost of, um, of going green, the, the cost of um, all of these types of things. So though that's the, basically the functional causes of the inflation rate, and then the central banks have to balance the pains. So yes, stagflation, particularly coming into, um, I think, 23, and then we think about um, what that might be for the 24 elections, um, that, that's concerning. Let's, let's go to a question. Because it's the total amount of stress. You see, the poli they all worsen together. If you have a bad economic set of circumstances, people get angry, and they should in a sense, that because some of them are suffering a lot. And, and that fosters that internal And that deals sure. with the other yeah. pro problems. Um, I can't suit. Can we get uh, the man in front in a, in a blue suit, a, a mic? These lights are bright. 30 minutes is not enough with, uh, with Ray Dalio. Good morning, Mr. Dalio. You mentioned that cash in is trash and the bonds and, uh, and the equity is going to go down. So what shall we do? That's a great question. Um, uh, the, the, the first thing uh, is to um, start to look at the return of your assets, including cash, in real dollars so that you think about buying power. And then think about the types of assets. For example, um, an inflation-indexed uh, bond is probably better than a nominal bond as you start to think about those investments. And then you have to diversify. You should, um, but we are in a part of it, I think, where most of the assets are, are going to go down. I would say, as individuals, I would discourage market timing. So, uh, you know, I could say the world can ch change. I could ask me a month from now, I might have a whole different point of view, and I don't want to leave you with that. So, the most important thing that you can do is have a well balanced portfolio, not to market time, but diversify. So look at the, the correlations. Have inflation hedge assets. Look at the assets in real terms and then hold on to that. The biggest problem of um, most retail investors and many non-retail investors is that they think when something goes up a lot, it's a good investment and not that it's more expensive. So I think that you have to diversify. I would not encourage market timing. Ride through these things about think of your assets in real purchasing power and think about like inflation indexed assets or, or those types of assets um, to help you do that and realize the risk of cash. How's Bridgewater doing in this environment? Great. Um, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to quote performance, but you know. Uh, uh, up, down, uh, it's, up, up more, it, it's, it, it, pure alpha? It, it, it's up. Uh, let's call it 25%-ish, something like that. Year to date? Yeah. That's all the time we have. I really appreciate you taking <laughs> yeah, I, um, But it was a great discussion, Ray, and I, I really appreciate it. I, I think the audience really appreciated it as well. Thank you. So, Thank you.